Okay, now Chad has asked me to uh, run a poll just to get, get, get things going and get a bit of a feel for what people and where they are uh, in their own schools in terms of learning management systems. So you'll get a little question come up on your screen in a minute. If you could all just basically uh, vote on that very quickly and we'll see what sort of mix uh, we have in the audience. Okay, most of the audience clearly have a LMS in place already. Um, okay, I'll close that down and uh, share the results with the audience. Very there you good. go, Chad. What do you think of that? Very good. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. So two, two thirds of uh, respondees uh, have an LMS in place. Seventy percent. Uh, Certainly uh, not at this point, and another 70% were thinking about or evaluating solutions. So we're all, I guess, here with uh, good reason this afternoon. Um, great to meet you all virtually speaking, by the way, so uh, thanks for dropping by. Um, look, what if we use the uh, the chat window just, just to qualify um, your response there to that poll? If if you did indicate that you're using an LMS or you're, you're in fact evaluating various learning management systems, um, perhaps quickly just type the, the LMS or LMSs into the chat window just to give us, a, a, I guess, a more specific feel for the system that you're using or the systems you're evaluating. Perhaps if we give you uh, 15 seconds to let us know. So people using or looking at Moodle, Scalaris, SharePoint gets a mention, Educate I've heard of. Desire to learn. Interesting. That's Canadian based. My PLS. Schoolology. Okay. Scalaris, not very happy with it. Investigating options. Some more Moodles, Moodlers, and Educate. Educate with a K. Very good, interesting. Well, that, that paints a bit of a picture. And then version-wise, some people being even more specific. Uh, Moodle 1.9 got mentioned a few times there. So that's perhaps a, an older version of a pretty popular open source learning management system. All right. Look, in terms of, um, this is our roadmap, and in terms of where we're, we're heading for the next 45 minutes or so, So certainly, when we when we when we when we talk a learning management systems, naturally synonymous with that is the acronym LMS. Um, and, and as we know, as educators, it's going to help us facilitate web-based learning. So experiences, delivering courseware, and hopefully assessing, tracking, and reporting on positive learning outcomes. So I think it's important. This is this is as Ian mentioned, an introductory section. It's session. It's fairly generic, um, but. It is important, you know, if, if we understand our organisation's need for a learning management system and choose the solution that best fits our requirement, uh, we're in a better position to uh, to succeed. So we'll, we'll kick start with some online trends. I'm big on data and analytics and sort of what's, what's fresh or current uh, in terms of the web demographic and um, internet activity. And I've, I've, I've found some, some pretty interesting, some data to that end. Um, it would be remiss of us not to have some sort of rationale for online learning or, or I guess, the uh, deployment of a learning management system. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll consider, I guess, some arguments for and against online learning. We'll look at, generally speaking, some, uh, I guess, some core features of all good learning management systems and then some examples of. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different LMSs and they fall into one or two camps typically, and I think uh, from the examples that have just come through, you've identified um, perhaps at least a couple of the, uh, the more popular solutions. And certainly some things to consider uh, when evaluating learning management systems. There was, a, there was a pretty small percentage of people who indicated in that poll 
uh, they don't currently have an LMS, and perhaps of some who do, uh, you, you, you know, you, you're not happy with the one that you've got and you're looking at alternatives. So uh, perhaps I can give you a heads up. Uh, I've been in your shoes as well. I've, uh, I have worked in schools uh, some time ago, but um, and, and used a variety of LMSs. So I've, I've, I guess I've been around the traps and seen, I guess, what works and what doesn't, and hopefully be able to share with you some sort of insight. Um, look, as far as trends go, um, I did a bit of poking around on. Uh, Australian Bureau of Statistics website and there's some data that's come out recently and uh, Nelson Online as well. Um, incidentally, I've, I've sort of uh, I've numbered the, the data and, and the source that I've, I've used for, for information through this presentation. I will make it available after the session and um, there's, a, there's a reference slide toward the end here for each of the numbers I'm referring to. But um, look, if we're going to embrace new technologies for the purpose of edu education, let's, let's face it, a lot of us are pretty serious about technology in schools and optimising the achievement of learning outcomes. It's really important for us to recognise current trends um, as far as internet activity um, is concerned. And you know, um, no better place to look than our own backyard. Um, you know, the ABS is telling us some pretty uh, significant things. Um, I've, I've come across, I guess, five stats that are fairly salient um, for 2011. In brackets after it, I guess, is the trend from the year previous. So four things, that, I guess, four key words that come to mind are wireless, mobile, broadband, and tablet. Um, if you threw in a fifth, it'd probably be time, as in time spent on a mobile device accessing the internet. But um, you can see there, uh, almost half of all internet connections in Australia are now mobile wireless. So that's not, not talking smartphones, that's talking, um, you know, I guess uh, USB, um, USB modems to the great extent plugged into laptops, for example. So that's 40, 47% of all internet connections in Australia. Um, 11 million mobile handset internet subscribers. So that, that's talking specifically to smartphones. Um, you know, there's, I think you'd be hard pressed to recognize um, any mobile phones manufactured these days that don't have some web enabled capability. And a lot of the plans that, are, you know, the, uh, I guess the, the phone plans that we can subscribe to um, post and prepaid uh, give us the option to bundle uh, an internet data allowance. So 11 million internet mobile plans uh, via via the phone. That's pretty substantial. And uh, more to the point, there's you know just as a little aside, there's in fact more mobile phones uh, in Australia than um, than people. So 20 something million. As far as internet. Um, so I guess it's not just uh, mobile and portable and wireless uh, access to the internet, it's speed of access. And as far as households are concerned, now uh, close on three quarters of us have broadband um, access at home to the internet. And that's defined as download speeds of 1.5 megabits per second or greater. So not jaw dropping by international standards, but, but pretty quick. Um, you know, certainly, uh, certainly, we click a page and something, something, loads of displays in a, you know, in, in an acceptable period of time. And and certainly, we'd be aware of the NBN, so the National Broadband Network rollout that's uh, that's being deployed. Uh, it's going to take close to 10 years. It's going to cover close to 97% of Australia's population. So it will be more and more not just about access to uh, the internet and mobility. But, uh, but speed of access. Um, incidentally, um, the ABS also tells us 68% uh, of internet users have purchased something via the, uh, via the web in the past year. And uh, the most popular internet-based activity has been recorded as social networking. 88% of 15 to 17 year olds, 86% 80, 18 to 24 year olds. So, that's what, what we're doing. 
and as far as Nielsen's concerned, that last point there, uh, where you know we're we're spending uh, we're spending more time per week using our uh, mobile device to access the internet. And I just skipped a point. I guess the uh, the use of tablet uh, tablet devices in the household is becoming uh, more commonplace. So, 18% as it stands of households. That's that's an estimate, and it's a fair penetration rate. Uh, it was 10% back in 2010. 2013, it's forecast to be 39% of Australian households will be accessing uh, the internet via a tablet device, such as I guess um, you know, an iPad by way of example. So what are your thoughts on that? If we just pause for a moment and perhaps unpack a few of those um, those stats with this in mind, what, what do you think the implications are for us as educators? If you want to uh, perhaps comment or raise raise a point in the, the chat area, I'll just pause for a minute. Feel free to drop something in there. So as we said, it seems to be all about wireless, mobile, broadband and tablet. I'll chat up, I'll come in there. I mean, obviously, uh, whatever LMS systems we are picking obviously need to be optimised uh, for those sort of platforms and, and deliver well and have good functionality uh, uh, through mobile platform, for instance. Be fairly obvious. If anyone else wants to make a comment, just put your hand up and I, you can, can say to solve the typing. And by the way, if you do like stats like the, like the ones Chad has put up, I've uh, chucked a link in I came across just today from Andrew Churches in New Zealand, a fabulous site with about seven or eight tools for, for immediate stats, all the sort of stats we're looking at. And I'll have a look at it now. Yeah, and I, I concur with what you're saying there about uh, accessibility, web accessibility, and um, you know designing online learning for multiple devices. So you know, gone are the days where we're bound by time or place. So uh, we're not all teaching and learning at our desk, sitting in front of a desk-bound computer. We need to uh, cater for laptops, smartphones, and tablets. Nathan's mentioned blended learning. G'day, Nathan. Um, is becoming the norm in schools or soon shall be. And Richard uh, Richard comments as educators, it's, it's easy to see that students are going to want to learn when and where they want. So I guess a, a more user-centered approach and I guess the, the, uh, the, fl the flexibility to access learning and online resources anywhere at any time. And uh, Nathan, you've got your hand up. Would you like to add, add to that? You're, you're uh, unmuted. Afsal's just uh, seconded what I was saying. Here now. Yeah, Nathan. G'day, Nathan. Yeah, I've also I've also noticed I've been tracking the uh, the um, creation of positions over the last five years in secondary schools around Australia. Um, within the last five years, we've seen the creation of positions such as directors of e-learning e-learning coordinators and things like that so that's a uh, indication of the seriousness that people are taking these positions and the realization that they require specific skills in order to effectively utilize the available technology Do people concur with that observation um, yeah i thank goodness I'm, we're starting to see those e-learning positions appear all over the place it's about time to There's still um, some that are usually set at about a 50% load or a half or a third load doing in learning and then a teaching load, although there are some schools that are now seeing that if you have a large school that it is really a full-time job and that you need to spend a lot of time training and developing quality online content customizable for your client group. Otherwise, essentially, you're wasting your time. I mean, that's that's my opinion. Um, would anyone else want to comment to that? Okay, Chad. Back to you, Matt. Thanks, Nathan, for that insight and and uh, 
and the other comments keep them coming as we said uh, if you want to if you want to stick your hand up and actually say something Ian's happy to unmute your mic or else just drop it in the in the chat area there and we'll tie in your question or comment as we as we move forward but certainly I, I guess in summary it's it's uh, for us as educators we need to be mindful of uh, the trends in uh, the web demographic uh, and how we're how we're using and accessing the internet and um, it's, it's certainly in our best interest to harness harness that uh, that trend in the context of uh, of education, I guess the challenge being, uh, you know, we're talking about new technologies and in some respects virtual tools, but a lot of what we do and deliver on a day-to-day -day basis um, in a school is kind of kind of face-to-face. -face. So um, those things at odds, and I guess that's where uh, an LMS might help us sort of uh, you know, bridge bridge the the virtual and the uh, and the face-to-face. Okay, I'll just move the slide forward. Look, as far as we've we've set a stack already about uh, learning management systems or LMSs, but you know, if we had to sum it up in a sentence, this is this is how I would define it. Um, you know, key elements being participants who communicate and collaborate. Um, they share they share resources, they share activities and ideas, and uh, if it's a really good system, meanwhile, we can track, assess, and report via the web. So as, as you might appreciate, um, good learning management system does these sorts of things. Uh, and in fact, the system more to the point is software, and it's not software that has to live on your computer or, or mine. Um, it's, it's generally web-based, and we don't need to know much about the, uh, you know, the, the infrastructure as such. It's, it's, it's simply a case of point and click. We, we fire up a modern web browser, add an address, and we can access the learning management system. So our teaching and learning, in, in certain respects, is uh, is accessible to everybody um, with, an, with a modern web browser and an internet connection. So to, to that end, if uh, I had to draw you a picture, it'd look a little bit like this. We've got the learning management system there in the uh, in the cloud. And the cloud, I guess, is really just a metaphor for the internet. It's often uh, the cloud is often used to represent the internet in uh, in uh, you know, technical or network diagrams, as a matter of fact. But um, you know, the, the cloud's built upon internet-based technologies and infrastructures, and the learning management system, for our intent and purposes, um, sits in the centre of that cloud. So it contains resources. Or it can contain resources such as documents, presentations, multimedia. It allows participants to collaborate, um, you know, using various tools. So they can be they can be discussion forums or messaging. Um, assessment tools as well, very pertinent to us as, as educators, quizzes, assignments, and, and certainly having the ability to track and report. Now, now we as participants, we could be teachers or learners, and I guess in a, in a truly collaborative environment, we ought to be both. Um, we're part of this representation as well and, and we can access the learning management system via the internet using uh, pretty much any any uh, web enabled device it could be a desk bound computer a laptop a smartphone or a tablet device so as we've said already um, it, it is I guess the whole uh, you know the mantra for web-based learning and learning management systems is learning by anyone anywhere at any time and in essence it can be about anything um, so we're no longer bound by you know the constraints of time or place as far as a rationale is concerned. Um, you know, 
a fair number of you indicated you've already made a decision on learning management system software and others are, uh, are in the process of um, evaluating possible solutions or re-evaluating. Um, you know, it's, it's more than likely um, you've had to or you'll need to sell the idea to various stakeholders at your school. So be it the executive or you know your, your fellow teachers, students or the parent body. Um, I've just knocked up a few points here in terms of, uh, well, I guess, points for and against the adoption of a learning management system. Um, I think uh, what I quickly discovered is that um, each point for having a, a learning management system in a school um, would more than likely have a flip side argument against it. Uh, I've left a, a, a row blank there perhaps to get you thinking as we talk through these pros and cons and uh, I'll see if you're able to add to the list for me. Look, as far as arguments for or pro um, an LMS, you know, cost cost is a cost is a big factor. Um, organisations of all shapes and sizes trying to do more with less, and um, learning management system software is seen as a rel relatively affordable solution, particularly open source um, software. Um, it does give us the ability to teach and learn outside the uh, you know the the nine to, the typical Monday to Friday nine to three timetable. So that's on the basis of cost, an LMS is a very easy sell. But on the same token, um, it will require an investment in your human capital, your staff. Um, as, as you will appreciate, any new system in a school will mean a change in processes, change in curriculum, uh, and this will affect staff, for better or for worse. Uh, it will mean that um, you know, with the adoption of new systems, you need to consider um, you know, software training and support, professional development, and, and naturally that translates into um, a time and money cost associated with it. Probably uh, with the next pro, I guess outside a school context, more likely, um, you know, it's, it's um, less travels, perhaps more relevant in uh, teaching and learning situations where, where participants are dispersed geographically. Um, you know, the, the aim there being to, uh, with, with an LMS, to transition from you know, face to face to, to a more so blended or virtual distant approach to teaching and learning. Um, but it is fair to say this, um, this does mean learning is less personal, less face to face contact, um, as in you know, less in person interactions. In fact, you know, with an LMS, we use different media to communicate. So, um, you know, instead of in a face-to-face -face setting, it will be um, literally eye contact. It will be, you know, visual, audio communication, hand gestures, and the like. You lose a lot of that um, with a learning management system, and you perhaps more rely on things like blogs and chats, messaging, and forums. So, you could argue it really does. Um, um, it, it, LMSs are prone to depersonalized learning in certain respects. As far as resource efficiency is concerned, um, LMSs, uh, one of its strengths is the ability to eliminate the duplication of effort that teachers, uh, you know, teachers might go about, um, you know, preparing, you know, the same programs, the same curriculum, the same lesson plans and resources duplicating effort if we can uh, share a virtual or online course across the subject with our colleagues it can reduce that duplication we can eliminate the paper chase and, and potentially do more with less this will require collaboration on the part of the teachers that they, they would need to work together um, as you would understand and uh, you know with that with that comes uh, you know, the effort involved in communicating, cooperating, um, being on the same page as far as um, your online learning and programs might be concerned. With flexible delivery, um, we've said this already, the anyone, anywhere at any time, so the 24-7, 365, not the uh, Monday to Friday, nine to three. Um, more to the point, I guess learning can be user-centric uh, and or self-guided, that could be perceived as a good thing. But um, with, you know, the I guess the limited structure um, you know, that we that we can sometimes force in in an online learning context, 
um, does that, as I mentioned before, does that kind of go against the grains as to what schools stand for and represent? Because you know we, we do know that schools are very good at providing structure uh, for education. They connect teachers and learners in a, in a formal setting. You know, so you could argue that flexible delivery, while it might be good in certain respects, um, you know, it might be might be undesirable on others. With collaboration, I, I guess um, it's not it's not a hard sell here either. I think in any way, be it, be it in a virtual or a face-to-face -face context or blended, you know, we, we'd all love as educators to have uh, teaching and learning that's rich, it's engaging, it's interactive. Um, if you're from the social construct of a school of thought, um, you want to be on about exchanging ideas, helping each other. Um, you know, we can all in fact be teachers and learners. Um, that's all well and good, but um, with a learning management system in place, I guess the flip side there is, well, you know, it won't run on autopilot. Um, you know, the learning experiences and the resources need to be well considered, well designed. You know, for example, forums, discussion forums will have to be moderated. Assignments, um, well, they just won't mark themselves. It'd be a good thing if they did, but um, we as teachers would need to grade them, give them feedback and so forth. Can we add any pros or cons to that um, shortlist as far as rationale for an LMS is concerned? Again, some of us are some way down the, the road already with the with the online learning journey. Um, feel free to jot, jot um, your thoughts or ideas in the in the chat area there. We'll just pause for a minute. So if you've had to sell the idea of a learning management system at your school or in the process of selling, what are some of the, uh, the strong points? Or what are the, what are the downsides that you might need to consider and uh, mitigate against? Janine makes a very good point there. That the system or the software needs to be user friendly for teachers and students. I think that's the thing um, with your LMS software as you're evaluating. As with any good software, um, if, if you can't work it out yourself in 10 minutes, it's probably not very usable software, let's face it. Richard mentions a better structure of coursework. So um, I agree that it will require staff to think about curriculum. So plan their online learning design before they sink their teeth into it. Hafsal mentions centralised learning and students have no excuse with any time, anywhere access. Any other points in terms of pro or con LMS deployment? Janine mentions central storage of files where teachers leave. Um, so I'm, I'm recognising that as an argument for an LMS does make lesson substitution very easy if your resources and your learning experiences and activities are, are online and good to go. Neil uh, argues that um, an LMS drags teachers kicking and screaming into the 21st century, um, but they will on the same token need a helping hand to do so. And that's fair enough. Um, the system, the software is one thing, how, how, we, uh, how we train and support and upskill our teachers is another. Well, the points are coming through thick and fast. I'm trying to keep up. Just backtracking for a moment, bear with me, and I'll try and keep a running commentary before we move forward. Uh, Richard again mentioned uh, providing for missed classes allow students to revise more easily. So that's right, I guess, the um, play on demand sort of concept with courseware and activities and experiences. So some of the tools for communication collaboration are synchronous or real time and others are asynchronous or can uh, can work with a delay. Daryl Daryl mentions uh, the need to have good internet connectivity at school and that's a that's a valid point. And Craig questions the uh, equitability of access um, for various literacy standards. So I guess with any tool or technology, um, 
you know there is there is the um, the prospect of creating a digital divide between the haves and the have-nots and it's and it is in fact I guess with these new technologies a new form of uh, literacy is it techno literacy I'm not quite sure what the, uh, the the phrase might be in schools Richard mentioning a con that um, staff could rely on last year's work more than recreating their work. Maybe, maybe there's the prospect that uh, teachers could be lazy or on the same token, it might save them or their colleagues from reinventing the wheel for next year's cohort where you can simply refine uh, you know, the, the online course or the work that's been done already. Richard, could you elaborate on the flipped classrooms? I'm a little out of the loop with that. And Alicia mentions the lack of facial expressions, intonations, and gestures. So um, that it... I, Chad, I might just butt in there. Save Richard typing. Yep. A whole lot of stuff. Please do. Um, the flipped classrooms. It's been talked about a lot across all the ed, ed blocks recently. It's the whole concept of like Khan Academy, where you you do a lot of the standard exposition teaching, delivery teaching. You do that as media, either audio or, or video, and get the students to watch that more in their own time. And then you spend the class time getting more into collaborative activities and explaining the differences, rather than just sitting through the lecture style classroom. Um, it's sort of flipping it around, making the homework. Where you actually consume the content that's basically what it is understood you know everyone's got their own opinion understood very good so we've got a rationale there and um and certainly um it is a, it is a sell i guess in a lot of respects we've got to pitch pitch the pitch the vision um or the concept of web-based learning or blended learning and um, I think part of it and we haven't really mentioned here I haven't mentioned and, and none of the points coming through have but um, you know it's um, it's certainly um, it's more more than simply the technology and the tools is definitely uh, you know we, we need to be mindful of the teachers and uh, and supporting supporting them um, you know, in, in using these new tools and systems and technologies effectively. That's a big part of it. Just moving forward, look, as far as um, features go, generic features in all good LMSs, I, I gave it a bit of thought um, and tried to categorize um, the feature sets into, into, into five. Communication, collaboration, assessment reporting and admin. So uh, if you're in the process of evaluating or re-evaluating learning management system software, um, this might be the sort of matrix you could, uh, you could work off. Um, naturally, communication tools allow the you know, communication, uh, the tools that allow users to connect with one another uh, in an online learning context. So um, they could be synchronous or asynchronous tools, so tools with uh, that are instant in real time, such as messaging, or that have a time delay, um, such as blogging. With collaborative tools, participants um, share resources, exchange ideas, help one another. Um, if you're really big on social constructionism, um, collaborative tools in learning management system software is um, is a you know is a, is a strong point. As far as assessment goes, this is a big thing for, for us as educators. We need the tools to measure the achievement of, of learning outcomes. Um, certainly any good learning management system platform should have an assignment type tool. So where we have the ability, uh, or, or more to the point, learners have the ability to uh, perhaps submit or upload an electronic file. It might be a report or an essay or a piece of work. Um, that can be graded and given feedback by a teacher. There should be uh, such a function in your LMS system. Um, perhaps in a less formal assessment sense, um, a quiz a quiz might be handy to have as well. You know, the idea that learners can revise um, on a periodic basis what they're meant to know 
um, about a subject and they get feedback instant feedback and on the same token um, teachers can tap into analytics that help them diagnose perhaps the strengths and weaknesses of students in their class. With respect to reporting tools uh, we ought to be able to monitor and report on um, learner activity and progress um, in an online course context so we need to look for those sort of th features in a, in a good LMS. And from an administrative point of view, we need tools to be able to manage users, their roles within the system, um, the courses, the courses, I guess, as LMS speak for online subjects, and enrolments, okay, I guess, ways to determine who gets into what online courses. So um, very generally speaking, they're the five key feature sets. Um, I reckon you ought to bear in mind and if you have already made a decision on an LMS, it's a fair chance you, um, whether to, you know, consciously or not, use some of these sort of um, feature sets as part of your evaluation criteria. I did a quick uh, scoot over to Wikipedia um, the other day there just to get a, a handle on you know, the vastness of learning management systems. Um, it had about 40 or 50 or so listed. I reckon that's the tip of the iceberg, but here they are. Um, there's pretty much a dike. Excuse me, Kurt. Yep. Would you be able to make that just this slide a little bit bigger? A absolutely. To view those? Oh, yeah. Well. How's that coming through now? Yeah, that's, that's better. That's, that's easier to follow. Brilliant. Thanks for that. Yep. So, look, there's a real dichotomy when it comes to classifying learning management system software. Um, as I said, this is, this is by no means an exhaustive list, but it's a pretty scary one. Um, there's two camps. There's the open source and the commercial LMS software camps. Uh, and, and I've listed some examples of each there, some, some of which you might be familiar with. Uh, Mer Myrtle got a few mentions there before. Uh, SharePoint, I, I believe Iscalaris got a mention. And there's there's a lot in between um, as well. Some are, some are big international solutions, others are US centric. Some are perhaps homegrown. Okay, thanks Anne. I'll just reduce that a little bit more back. Just bear with me folks while I just play with the resolution. Yeah, it's a, it's a good list but a big one. Um, don't be overwhelmed by that. I think the reality is when it comes to uh, comes to evaluating LMS, you probably want a handful of um, candidates, perhaps a short list let's call it, when you've cut through all the fluff. Um, but you know, more to the point, you need to be clear on whether you, you, you know, your school needs an LMS um, and can it afford it in terms of time and cost and you know ongoing commitment to it. Look, with the open source um, LMS software, um, what that open source really means is that the source is open. Um, you know, it's, it's free or I guess there's freedom to access the, the software to download it, modify it, distribute it. Um, open source software is often um, available on, you know, via a community-based model. So the software is developed and um, maintained and, and built upon um, you know, a, a web-based community. Moodle is a good example of an open source LMS software. And there's others there. Are there any others, perhaps, if you want to type quickly into the chat window that you might have come across? Um, you might have heard of Sakai. You may have used Ning, uh, by way of example. I was speaking to somebody a couple of weeks back. They mentioned Canvas. I'd never heard of it, but they were singing its praises. Perhaps if you want to drop something in the chat window there, open source software that you've come across or know a bit about, and maybe in a couple further words, tell us, Tell us what you know about it or what you think of it. Yep, 
Thanks, Ian. Study whiz, I've heard of that. And some are targeting, I guess, specific industry sectors. Um, you know, they're, uh, they're designed specifically for uh, the education sector or corporate or government or small or big business. Um, Daryl's mentioned My Big Campus. But it has a Facebook type interface. Doesn't know much about it, but that's curious. Um, and, and that seems to be a bit of a trend. I've noticed in the last few years, learning management systems becoming a lot more social, not just in their tools and functionality, but their interface, their design. Thanks for mentioning that. And Janine says Schoolology. It's not on the list, but it has a great interface, Facebook-like. The students love it. And that's the thing, they kind of live and breathe. Social networks. And um, if we can tap into their world for the purpose of teaching and learning, it's a win-win really, isn't it? It makes our job easy as teachers. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot more attractive from a student point of view. And Ian's mentioned Edmodo, much the same thing. Sure. Yep. Ian. Could I request that you update your, your current list? Uh, with some of these suggestions and send that out to myself where I can publish it. Um, I'll probably, probably publish something like this to the blog, I think. Yep. It's nice to have a big list like this. Yep, well indeed. Yep. Well indeed. And as a matter of fact, Cheers. if if I if I source it from the original site, as I said, it's a it's a Wikipedia page. Um, some right. some of the, the LMS software listed actually have links to the uh, original yep. sites so that it, we can do that. Not a worry. Um, look, as far as the um, the other camp of learning management system software is concerned, the commercial or the proprietary, um, the code's centrally controlled, um, generally by you know an organisation or company. Um, it's not so much the cost, uh, uh, pardon me, the community-based model, but more likely a cost per license or per seat type model. So user pays. Um, Blackboard is a good example of that. Um, you can see SharePoint, uh, well, I guess Scalaris is another. Some of you would be familiar with those. Um, with the commercial solutions, um, there's typically some sort of software or product maintenance agreement. So the company providing the software for a, for a cost, um, you know, under contract agrees to maintain the software so long as your organization, your school is um, paying for its use. So in general, the you know the commercial solutions are more polished, more robust. But um, it's not to say there's some uh, there's certainly some shabby commercial LMSs out there. And on the same token, there's some pretty robust and, and scalable open source soft LMS software too. Um, naturally, um, I think it's fair to say the commercial list probably is at least twice the uh, twice the size of the open source list. That's no surprise. The open source are. Uh, the open source solutions are really driven by the people, the users, the community. So I guess the educators, the developers, um, and the uh, the technical folk. Whereas the commercial LMS solution um, are really driven and dictated by the uh, the companies who provide them. So they're kind of uh, more commercial driven. Uh, Neil mentions would be interesting to see the list in order of current number of installations. It would indeed. Um, I'm not sure if there is any uh, you know, any authority on that in terms of I guess each of these uh, each of these you know. Yeah. Yeah, Chad, can you organise that for us, please? <laughs> I'll uh, I might have a little poke around. I'll be curious. I could certainly speak. I could certainly speak for me. It'd be an excellent resource if it could come up with it. it yeah, it would be a great read. I mean, in, in some in some following slides, I've got some stats. I guess from some. Um, some LMS surveys, but you know it's a representative sample, so it would be really hard. And and what I was going to say, um, I mean Moodle as an example, I I could certainly throw some figures at you in terms of registered sites and users across the planet. But again, um, you know, it's only a representative sample, um, and not all not all LMS um, administrators register their sites either. And on the same token, um, with the commercial solutions, you know who's Who's to say they're not inflating their their figures to make their uh, their software seem like it's more popular than it is? Thanks, Ian, for the uh, for the time pointer, and we're we're on track. I think we're we're travelling pretty okay. 
Um, but yeah, look, with Myrtle by way of example, um, you know, Myrtle.org um, has a, real, a million registered users. Um, you know, there's uh, there's tens of thousands of registered sites across the planet. Uh, some of them have you know, tens of thousands of users. So there would be many millions of um, of users. Hard to quantify. And as I said, in the case of Moodle, at least, um, you know, I would reckon only a small proportion of LMS administrators even bother to register their site. Um, so I will look for a, some sort of um, I guess leagues table, if you like, for one of a better phrase. But um, I'm not sure if one exists. Just using Moodle um, as as an example here again, um, simply because I know this perhaps better than any LMS. Um, there was a couple surveys that have been conducted in recent years by the eLearning Guild. Um, it's a U.S. organisation. Um, it's it is an authority um, in the area. You know, puts out a lot of research and reports and publications and has um, members all over the uh, over the planet. They, they conducted a couple LMS type surveys in 2010 and 2008 um, you know, on its members. The respondents um, you know, were working for organisations of various sizes and in industry sectors. Um, and as a matter of fact, the respondees um, you know, were using, some were using commercial learning management systems, others were using open source solutions. So there was no there's no agenda there as far as the survey was concerned, um, but you know the the findings the findings of the surveys were were reported on by the eLearning Guild, um, and Moodle come up trumps as a matter of fact in both um, both reports or both surveys if you like um, as punching above its weight even against some of the commercial players in the LMS market. So it, it ranked first on those metrics I've listed on the slide there. So as far as cost is concerned. Um, it's easy to install, easy to use. If you're using Moodle, you could um, you, know, you could pay testimony to that. Um, time to implement um, its assessment features, how it how it can add value to your business, and you know its ability to be customised. So it was a winner. Moodle was a winner relative to the other LMSs that were responded on in the respective surveys. Um, so I think if you're evaluating LMSs, uh, Moodle, if it isn't, it probably deserves to be on your short list. Um, but I reckon there's no harm perhaps in uh, evaluating at least one other open source solution and at the very least throwing one or two commercial um, LMS software in the mix as well so you get a bit of a balanced perspective. And, and just as a little aside, um, you know the upcoming virtual PD sessions that we're going to run in the following weeks will f will uh, feature the Moodle LMS, so you're aware. Um, and we've put up a demo site for um, ISQ, and it's running Moodle as well. A couple points just coming through, and pl please happy to tie these in as we go. Janine's mentioned that her tech, or the tech guy, says Moodle needs a full timer to set it up and use. How difficult is it? Um, well, look, I think it's easier to use than it is to install, configure, optimize, or secure. Let's be honest. Um, you know, um, unfortunately, Moodle, like a lot of that software on that list there before, particularly the open source software, it's not as easy as downloading it, um, running some sort of executable file, and away you go. It does um, it does take a level of expertise to get it up and running. Um, so it's not as easy as um, you know, installing a disk or putting toast in your toaster. Um, Nathan mentioned tech guy finds it least problematic of the software he has to deal with um, and that it doesn't require a full-time tech. So, um, you know, it's a, case of, it's a case of if you've got the internal capabilities and skills and uh, expertise to get this up and running and to maintain it. Um, I, I would say more to the point, it's, um, it's got to be owned by various stakeholders. It's not just a job for your IT department or, or you, perhaps as the e-learning manager or you know director of director of um, technology. Richard mentions uh, putting all students in class courses um, takes a heap of time at least as, as we're playing with it. 
What software are you talking of there, Richard? Uh, Myrtle, thank you. And as far as uh, upgrading goes, um, Nathan mentions he does one big patch or upgrade at the start of the year. So that's the thing with this software, particularly the open source software, where it can uh, be a little bit buggy and, and, and needs to be patched. As I said, perhaps not as polished as the commercial solution that that the, uh, the company providing the software for a cost will likely provide for you and maintain under a, under an agreement. Yeah, I guess we can talk about um, you know LMS software Moodle, for example, being cheap, but you know, cheap's uh, you know cheap's a relative thing. Um, you know, and are we talking of cost in terms of funding or money or, or time? Time for teachers or time to, to learn the software and use it effectively and or time for your, for your, your technical people to install, configure, optimise and secure the software. Nathan's, uh, they're running a tight ship and they're managing to just keep it simple. Just push the slide forward, and I'm mindful of time. We're looking to wrap this up in the next five. Um, look, for those uh, evaluating or re-evaluating LMS software, and for those who have already, um, you've probably had to consider a range of things. We talk about cost. Um, as I said, um, it might be more than just a, a monetary cost to your school. Um, talk of all sorts of costs associated with deploying a learning management system, be it commercial or open source. So the cost of ownership, I guess that's the total cost. Um, you know, there can be hidden costs there that you uh, you might not have considered from the get-go. So the, the, you know, the cost of installing the software, um, maintaining it, upgrading it, backing it up, and the cost of the hardware if you're going to host the, the LMS software internally on your local area network you're likely going to need a server to do so. On the same token, um, that, you know, if, if there's not the internal um, expertise or capability or, or infrastructure for that matter, it might be a case of a, a cost involved with consultancy or training and support via um, an external organisation outsourcing some aspects of your LMS deployment. With respect to maintenance, I guess you've got to ask yourself the question, who, who owns or who's going to own the project? Who's going to maintain and administer the learning management system? Is it your job um, or do you have a team of people who are going to uh, co-own the initiative? Or is it something that gets flipped past to the techs and they're going to take care of it in the, uh, in the spare time that they have amongst other priorities? With support, I think support is something that really we need to bear in mind with the with the LMS software you uh, you decide on. Is it well documented? Are there tutorials? Um, is there a community? Is there a web-based community that supports this software so you can you can learn or reach out um, to a community of users and educators and researchers and uh, technical people when you get stuck or you need an idea. Um, also, with respect to support, I mean, you've got to make the decision, is your school going to fly solo or are you looking to engage uh, a provider, you know, an expert or partner with an organisation who can give you a leg up and help you um, fast track your project, keep it moving in the right direction. With standards, does the LMS comply to web standards? I could, I could throw a, a raft of acronyms around, things like SCORM, IMS, HTML, CMS, XML. Um, you want to be certain your LMS is compatible with these modern web standards. With integration, um, it might be a case of ensuring that the learning management system can integrate with school-based systems, such as your reporting system or your school database or your student management system, record system, um, or single sign-on authentication. So you want to you want to make certain that is possible. So you don't create these technical islands across your school where you've got all of these 
software and system, but they don't, uh, they don't speak to one another, they're not integrated. With respect to hardware and software, hardware-wise, you'll want to consider the server or servers that your school might need to, uh, to run your LMS software. So think of things like the CPU, um, the memory that might be required, disk storage, and so forth. With respect to software, you want to look at the LMS and see what, what it's compatible with software-wise. You know, what operating systems are supported, um, what database will you need, what web server, um, scripting language, what web browsers are supported, and so forth. They're the kind of things um, you will want to bear in mind. Not all LMS software is created equal, so you want to know that um, you know, your software, the software you're currently running in your school is supported, and it can integrate with, uh, with your systems if that's required, and, it'll, and the software also complies with web standards. Feature-wise, I guess, lastly, as per one of those earlier slides, um, you know, how, how do the, uh, the LMS feature sets compare when you're stacking up um, you know, administrative features, course management, activities, assessment, reporting, and so forth. Um, what I had made available with the presentation was um, the LMS evaluation tool and a white paper. So those resources have been linked to this session, and, and they may be of value. I guess they go into these considerations in a, in a bit greater detail. We might wrap things up very shortly now that we're right on 4.30. Um, any questions or comments in closure? You can either drop something in the chat area or simply <coughs> stick your hand up and uh, Ian will happily unmute your mic. Yeah, just put your hand up and I will, I will see it. Yeah. Close down the recorder now, please. Just still, if you do have a question, uh, bring it forward. I'm just, I'm just letting Chad know that the recorder is off at the stage. Um, any more questions? Um, um, I'll just do a quick plug in the for the e learning forum in the chat window there that, that I run. I think there's some fairly good stuff comes through there, so have a look at that. Um, another quick plug too. Um, Chad, if you don't mind, as for the NBN EES funding that has come through that we've been successful with gaining, and keep your eyes out in your schools for the application process for that. It's going to be a national project with lots of uh, services to be offered to schools running at 50 or 100 megabits per second on the internet. Any final questions to Chad or myself? Chad's still putting up some references uh, on that on there. So that won't make the recording, unfortunately. But that's fine. What, what I'll do, Ian, I'll, I'll make these yeah. uh, resources available on our, uh, I guess, our demo LMS site. I'll just drop the address in right. there in Good. the chat window Good. for everybody. Okay. All right. If there's any last questions. Nathan's just put a link in there of some kind too, pragmatic view. All right, Chad, I will shut down the meeting now. Absolutely. Thanks, Ian, and thanks and to everybody thank, today. And thank, and thank you very much for delivering the session today. Pleasure. Okay, bye-bye, everybody.